Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for the Kennedy Foundation and the University Health Network Ashmere Transplant Center uh, quarterly webinar series on liver disease and liver transplantation. My name is Nan Maximovich. I'm the Senior Manager of Support and Education at the Canadian Liver Foundation. I'll be the moderator and host for this webinar. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Canadian Liver Foundation's national office in Markham, Ontario, is situated upon traditional territories of the Anishinaabe peoples and of the Haudenosaunee peoples, covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. The Ashmere Transplant Centre and the Centre for Living Organ Donation at the UHN are located on traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now home to many diverse First Nations, uh, Inuit, and Métis people. This is the fourth and final session of our quarterly series for 2022. Uh, in our first session, our speakers discuss liver disease, clinical management, and treatment options for liver failure. In the second session, our speakers talked about the pathways to liver transplantation, uh, specifically the donor assessment process and the surgery and recovery. In our third session, uh, we discussed the pre-transplant journey, uh, the referral and the assessment process, along with the transplant waitlisting. And at this final session, we will be discussing the post-transplant journey, uh, including the surgery, uh, surgery outcomes, uh, any kind of medications following surgery, and specific follow-ups. Uh, we will have our, our patient speakers, uh, our healthcare provider, followed up with a Q&A at the end of the session. So we are joined today by three of our speakers. We have Dr. Leslie Lilly, a transplant liver specialist in the multi-organ transplant program at UHN. We also have Sandra Holsworth, post-transplant recipient, and Ms. Svia Petliar, also a nurse and a pre-lung transplant coordinator with the Ashmere Transplant Center, who was diagnosed with PSC and in April 22 received a living donor liver transplant. So feel free to use the comment feed uh, to ask your questions during the presentation. And note that the questions will be answered following the speaker's presentations. Uh, should we not get a chance to answer your specific questions, uh, rest assured we will be able to obtain an answer and provide it in the comment feed, either following the presentation or a few days afterwards. The session will be available post-event on the Canadian Liver Foundation uh, page, uh, as well as the Center for Living Organ Donation Facebook and YouTube pages in the coming days. So at this time, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Leslie, transplant hepatologist, uh, where he will be providing us with an overview of uh, liver disease, insights into the post-transplant journey, uh, the recovery process, along with uh, the medication regimen and staying healthy. Uh, Dr. Lilly, um, over to you. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate uh, your introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this program. Um, uh, you know, ed education, whether it's of our own trainees or whether it's of my patients or the public in general, is a big part of our mission here at UHN. And I think this is an excellent opportunity to do this. Uh, I, some of the material I'm going to cover is a little bit repetitive over what some of the audience may have experienced in the last session in, in, in the third program, but I think it's important to kind of establish the context before we move into the uh, various aspects of the post-transplant journey. It's funny because I, I did a clinic today and I saw about a dozen patients on the transplant waiting list. And I have to say that I'm pretty sure that everything I say this evening, I already said several times earlier this afternoon in response to my patients' questions. So by way of introduction, uh, the AJT is, uh, contains the largest liver transplant program in Canada. And indeed for the last two years, the largest liver transplant program in North America. Um, we are particularly known for our living donor program. We're now over 1,200 living donor liver transplants, about almost 900 in the adult population, or 300 in the, in the kids. And we follow um, well over 2,000 liver transplant recipients, and we provide liver transplant care to our, the Winnipeg uh, population. And, and also we, we accept and we'll see referrals from across the country uh, that are directed to, to us because of our unique skill set here at Toronto General Hospital. Next slide. This is, this is, this is kind of bread and butter material. Um, uh, and I can, I can basically say that, that we, we transplant um, three different large groups of liver diseases. Most commonly, the patients that we see for transplant have chronic liver disease that has progressed to cirrhosis. And the cirrhosis has become complicated by one or more of the various signs of liver failure. 
And those are listed here. The commonest sign of liver failure is salt and water retention with, uh, uh, with uh, swelling of the legs and the belly. But we also, of course, see patients who become jaundiced, patients who develop uh, issues with their mentation, with drowsiness, confusion, and coma. And patients may be referred to us for bleeding complications as well. Um, there are a number of other complications that might precipitate a transplant referral. Uh, we do several cases a year of patients with lung disease, secondary to their liver disease, and people are somewhat surprised to hear sometimes that, uh, that close to 40% of all of our liver transplants are done in patients primarily for the management of primary liver cancer. About two to 4% of our annual transplant activity is patients with fulminant or acute liver failure. This is usually caused by a, a reaction to a medication, uh, by a virus, uh, uh, or by a number of uh, somewhat more obscure causes. And there's a solid population of a few percent that is transplanted for metabolic disorders where liver function is well preserved, but there's a genetic defect that can only be curable by replacing the patient's liver. And this is a, a very important part of um, the pediatric transplant population, as you can imagine, because most of these are things that people are born with, but it also makes up a few cases a year in our transplant program as well. Uh, we do on average about 200 adult liver transplants per year. Uh, approximately a third of those uh, are living donor recipients and about the other two thirds receive their livers from, from deceased donors. Next slide. The assessment process is fairly, fairly standardized and fairly rigorous. Um, we receive a, a, a referral form from the, 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 the patient's uh, primary gastroenterologist or hepatologist. The referral is triaged by one of us. And if it's deemed to be appropriate, the patient is booked to see us in our assessment clinic. Um, this was an entirely a virtual process until earlier this year when we've returned to inpatient visits. The patients are assessed initially by one of us in the assessment clinic, and it's deemed appropriate to proceed. Then, then initial visits are organized that involve both screening the patient for other medical problems, but also assessing the patient's uh, support system, their appropriateness for general anesthesia, uh, their their um, access to drug coverage uh, and various aspects as well. The patients are assigned a coordinator uh, once they enter the assessment process and we've shuffled things around recently so that that same coordinator will follow the patient through assessment and through listing all the way up until they're called in to undergo liver transplantation. Patients, on the, patients uh, are discussed uh, prior to listing by all members of our liver transplant surgeons, physicians, uh, a number of outside consultants, and if and again, if deemed appropriate, they're placed on the transplant waiting list. Uh, they're seen on a regular basis while on the waiting list, and that was the purpose of the clinic I mentioned this afternoon. Uh, uh, and and then once transplanted, their care is transitioned to a post-transplant uh, coordinator. But in general, the same liver doctor that saw them pre-transplant will continue to look after them post-transplant. We are referred between four and five hundred patients per year to assess for transplant. We list roughly two thirds of those. And then of those that we list about roughly, uh, again, we do about 200 liver transplants per year. Next slide. Uh, we do ask the referring physician to, to in addition to providing um, a consultation notes and, and things like that as well, we want to know what other investigations have been done. If the patient's had a liver biopsy, we'd like to have the report and usually the biopsy itself available for review. Many of our patients these days have a number of coexisting medical problems, and it's always appreciated the referring doctors started to address those with cardiac tests, with, with breathing tests, and things like that. And those all contribute to allowing us to form a complete picture of this patient and to accurately assess the risk-benefit ratio of undergoing transplantation. Uh, when, when we see the patients, they usually have blood work done the same day. They'll have a chest x-ray, they'll have an ECG and any other specific investigations that might be deemed appropriate at the time. This has all been pretty standardized. And as we return to in-person visits, we'll actually, I think, uh, end up becoming more efficient than we were uh, struggling with when it was all virtual. Next slide. Just by, for purposes of general terms, we, we see most of the patients referred to us for assessment on Tuesdays. The patients that are listed are seen in the clinic on Wednesdays for the last almost five years, we've had a dedicated clinic on Thursday afternoons to assess patients for transplant uh, in whom alcohol is the cause or one of the causes of their end-stage liver disease because of changes in the criteria for referral for transplant in patients with alcoholic liver disease. 
Next slide. This, this slide is, is somewhat confusing because I, I, I think it's, it's important to realize for patients that, that um, although any, anybody on this list might be involved in their care, clearly the roles that people play are gonna vary depending upon what stage of the transplant journey the patient is, act, is actually experiencing. A transplant hepatologist meets the patient on day one and continues to care for that patient throughout and that's the one constant. The liver transplant surgeons, uh, one of our surgeons assesses all the patients as they're listed to determine their surgical fitness. They obviously carry out the operation, but post discharge, the vast majority of the cl clinical care of the transplant recipients is again returned into the hands of the transplant hepatologist, along with a dedicated transplant coordinator. We're backed up by administrative support. There's a social worker that sees, the, sees all the patients pre-transplant and sees patients on an as-need basis post-transplant. We have a separate social worker for the alcoholic liver disease program because of her experience in addiction uh, in, in that area. Uh, psychiatrists see all the patients um, pre-transplant who have coexisting psychiatric issues as well as those patients with alcoholic liver disease. Pharmacists come and go as necessary. And of course, for many of our patients, physiotherapy and dietary management is also very important. The primary person with whom we communicate pre and post transplant is the family doctor, who is this, this, the spider at the center of the spider web, so to speak. Although most of the patients that we see are referred to us by gastroenterologists, it is not our expectation that most of the community gastroenterologists will be involved in the patient's care post transplant. It's not an area in which they feel comfortable and we're quite capable of uh, overseeing things from Toronto General Hospital. I think it's important to remember that patients that are referred to us from centers like um, Winnipeg, where we do their transplants, Ottawa and Kingston, uh, there are dedicated liver transplant clinics run in those cities and supervised by transplant hepatologists, many of them trained here in Toronto. And for patients, for example, from Ottawa, once the first six months has gone by and most of the dust of the transplant has, to speak, settled, that those, those patients can expect their primary transplant care to, re to return to their home hospital at the Ottawa General or in the case of our Kingston patients at Kingston General Hospital. There's an endocrinologist on this list because uh, diabetes is such an important coexisting problem in our patient population, particularly with the growth of fatty liver disease as a major indication, that it's almost hard for me to remember patients uh, in whom an endocrinologist has not become involved at one point or another, but they are serve in a consulting role. Uh, uh, um, many of our patients require home care. Uh, and, and I think the, the last, but certainly not the least item is to emphasize the importance of family and other support people in terms of ensuring that our patients get to, through and beyond their liver transplant with a high degree of success. Next slide. I mean, it, it's, it's funny because, because one of my classic lines in, in when I talk to patients is we don't transplant patients to make them feel better, we transplant patients to make them live longer, which is exactly what we do. I mean, the average survival of patients listed for a liver transplant would be expected to be two years or less. And the average survival of patients who undergo liver transplantation is now close to 20 years. But those patients do feel better. In fact, it's estimated that about 80% of our post-transplant patients will feel uh, as well as an age match group of people from the general population. They'll be more energetic, their, their dietary restrictions will lessen. Most of our patients are sodium and fluid restricted. Uh, their anemia will generally get better. Their mentation will clear. Uh, their overall health status will improve. Their quality of life, of course, gets better. And they will live longer and better as a result of receiving a healthy liver. Next slide. There are a few downsides. And again, one of my favorite lines is that our job is to turn liver disease into transplant disease, and we do so because transplant disease has a much better prognosis. Uh, patients realize, I think, that they will be expected to take special medications to protect the graft uh, uh, after transplantation. And although there is a lot of research going on, I, I, my standard line is, I think, uh, as of today, it's safe to assume that some or all of those medications are going to continue to be necessary for the rest of the patient's life. Liver patients are somewhat fortunate in that the risks of rejection are lower, the consequences of rejection are less, 
And liver transplant patients often end up on a single agent for post-transplant care, sometimes as early as a year post-transplant, whereas recipients of hearts and, and lungs and, and kidneys are usually on triple immunotherapy for the rest of their life. Um, we do, we do follow our patients lifelong, uh, or if they're from outside centers, they're followed their lifelong. Uh, so having a liver transplant is not like having a whole lot of other operations where basically once the, su the sutures or staples come out and everything's healed up nicely, that's the end of the story. In, in my world, that's the only the beginning of the story. And of course, there are downsides to these medications. Um, they, they increase the long-term risks of various sorts of infections. Uh, there are a number of different malignancies, cancers that are more common in patients on immunosuppressive medications. And many of the diseases for which we do liver transplants have the capacity of recurring in the graft. Um, and that was, of course, classically the problem when we transplanted patients with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, their viruses after all. But most of the liver diseases for which we do transplants have the potential of possible recurrence, including, of course, alcoholic liver disease, fatty liver disease, and the autoimmune liver diseases we see, such as primary biliary cholangitis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and autoimmune hepatitis. Next slide. This, this, I think, is an underestimate. In, you know, in the province of Ontario, there are typically between 230 and 240 patients listed for liver, trans, uh, liver transplant. That, that's in our program. London will have another 30 to 50 patients listed for transplant. And across the country, there are a couple of hundred more. There are only seven adult liver transplant centers in Canada, Vancouver, Edmonton, London, Toronto, Montreal, English, Montreal, French, and Halifax. And, a, and between 40 and 50% of all the liver transplants done in Canada are performed on University Avenue in downtown Toronto. You can see the distribution of our recipients. Uh, it, it reflects the blood groups. Uh, the yellow part of this pie is supposed to say O blood type patients. They currently, as of this week, made up 116 of the listed patients. Blood group A is a bit less than 83 patients reflecting the the prevalence of the blood groups in our population. Blood group B is about 40 patients. Blood group AB is only a handful of patients. And, and uh, as you can see, if you do those numbers quickly, that makes up the approximately 240 patients that are listed for transplant uh, through the UHN uh, and, and registered at the TGLN uh, system uh, downtown. Next slide. This is something that this audience should be very familiar with by now, of course, is, is that uh, there are two pathways to liver transplantation here in Toronto. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we do uh, living donation in Toronto. We're the largest living donor program in the Western world. We have now done in excess of 1,200 living donors in Toronto. And people think this is quite novel and quite interesting, except if you go to Japan or, or South Korea or India or Turkey or much of China, where in those countries, uh, well over 90% of all liver transplants are done using living donation. So what makes us unique in the Western world makes us pretty ordinary when you look at centers in the Eastern world as well. Um, there are approximately 20 programs in North America that do living donor transplants uh, uh, for adults. Um, uh, the, the top three are Pittsburgh, us and uh, University of Texas in San Antonio, uh, we each do 40 plus adult living donor liver transplants. All the other programs do fewer than that. And there are still a large number of programs that are doing only uh, uh, 10 or 12 transplants per year. So I think it's safe to say that we are widely known for our extensive experience in living donor liver transplantation. It's also important to know that we're the, one of the only centers in the world that actually does anonymous living donor liver transplantation. It's actually illegal in many countries to do that. In places like Korea, it's, it's legislated that your donor has to be a blood relative. And so we've done several dozen adults and even more children using anon anonymous living donors and that makes our program quite special. Uh, it also is quite a remarkable achievement. These are outstanding individuals who do this selfless act because they've heard of or read about or maybe even met a liver, liver transplant recipient in need of an organ and they've given this precious gift of life. Next slide. Our results are excellent. I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, comparing our results to other large North American liver transplant centers. And you can see that, that the, the, the light blue line are our survival statistics at one year out to 10 years in those that receive living donor grafts. And the, the orangey colored line below that is the survival in the deceased donor recipients. And you'll notice that there's a difference. 
And that difference is, is present actually from the moment that these patients are listed and persists and continues from, from after transplantation. And they're, they're, the, the principal reason for this is that receiving a living donor liver transplant allows you to be transplanted when you have less advanced liver disease. And that reduces the surgical risk, shortens the post-operative stay, minimizes the number of complications, both in the short term and the long term afterwards. The advantage of receiving a living donor graft actually begins at the moment of listing because the presence of a living donor largely allows us to eliminate the risk of death on the waiting list. So this difference between the two lines is actually even further magnified if you measure survival from the moment of listing rather than from one year onwards as is shown here. But even, even for those that receive deceased donors, as I mentioned, uh, the 20 year survival is now more than 50%. The 10 year survival is in the range of 75%. Compare this to the average survival of approximately two years in patients who sit on our waiting list. And these results are outstanding. Next slide. I think it's important to realize how we do things. Um, when patients are listed for liver transplant, their position on the waiting list is determined by their MELT score. This is a number calculated based on their bilirubin, their INR, their creatinine, and their sodium value. And this system was institutionalized in the province of Ontario just about 10 years ago. So irrespective of the cause of their disease, of the patient's size, the patient's gender, the patient's waiting time, uh, the, the, uh, the patient's um, status, whether an inpatient or outpatient, their position on the waiting list is determined by that MELT score. Um, uh, and the, the purpose of this, is, the idea is that if a liver is donated from a deceased donor tonight, it should go into the patient on the waiting list in that blood group that has the greatest risk of dying of their liver disease tomorrow. And this is a difficult concept for people who've been sitting on the waiting list for a year or two because they realize at one level that they haven't been transplanted yet because there's always been somebody sicker than them who needs the organ more than they do. But it, I also realize that you're just sitting on the waiting list and nothing is happening. And those are the patients we primarily try to target with living donation. Blood group is important. We are obliged, except in very special cases, to use only identical blood groups for, for deceased donor transplantation. Um, uh, waiting time is secondary to MELT score, so it's used as a tiebreaker. And there are a number of things that determine the patient's status. So children in general get higher status on, waiting, on our waiting list because the number of organs that are appropriate for children is so limited. Um, patients with cancer tend to get higher status because they often have normal or very low sodium melt scores. And there's a lot of finer details that determine this as well. And this is taken directly from the TGLN website and they explain it actually quite well there. Um, if you are awaiting a living donor, then the blood type no longer has to be identical. So if your example, if your blood group is A, you can safely receive a, a, a liver from an O or an A person if they're a living donor. But if you're an A sitting on the, on the, on the waiting list waiting for a deceased donor, you're only gonna be offered A livers. That's because the O's of course need the O livers. Next slide. Now, th this is something I've never experienced, but, uh, and we no longer give out pagers to everybody, but when an organ becomes available, we reach out to the patient that comes up next in the allocation algorithm uh, that's run through the TGLN computer system. We contact the patient. A brief, a brief questionnaire is, 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 is put to the patient to determine that they are fit for transplant. For example, if patients have just been started a, a day earlier on antibiotics for an active infection, we're not likely to proceed. If the patient is in hospital, we, which we find out sometimes this way, we need more information before we can decide to proceed. Uh, and, and also if the patient has, is, is, is actually actively infected with COVID, we're not gonna be prepared to do transplant under those circumstances as well. If the screening, uh, screening test is negative, the patient is, is asked to come down to the hospital. Uh, uh, they're, they're admitted to the ward, usually directly, as this tends to often happen after hours. Uh, they're seen by the uh, admitting, admitting team. Their blood work is repeated. Their chest x-ray is repeated. Their ECG is repeated. Uh, they're seen by our surgical team uh, to sign consent. And then they sit and then they wait. It's important for our recipients to know that at least 10% of the time, it's a false alarm. We call in the recipients before we've actually laid eyes on the donor organ. We have to do that in order to optimize timing. And, and we will sometimes go out and retrieve an organ 
and, 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 and look at it and determine that this organ may not be a whole lot better than the organ we were about to replace it with. And so it's very common for patients to be called in for transplant, sit around on the ward for, for eight or 12 or 16 hours, and then be advised that unfortunately the organ is unsuitable and that they will be discharged. Um, it's good practice, but also very anxiety provoking for our patients as well. Next slide. I'm not a surgeon. And when I describe transplant surgery, I think that becomes pretty obvious. The surgery takes typically around six hours. Uh, obviously it, it can vary. I mean, I think our in-house record for a liver transplant is just under three hours. And we've had patients, of course, that have run to 12 hours or longer. Um, the, the average hospital stay is a little closer to 10 than 14 days these days. It varies quite a bit. It's a little shorter in the living donor recipients than the deceased donor recipients because they're not as sick. And clearly it's gonna be shorter in patients that are well enough to be called in from home for their transplant than it will be in patients who are already in hospital, particularly if those patients are critically ill on life support. The patients return to the clinic after discharge at approximately the three week mark to have their staples out. We inspect the wound, we assess the patient's fluid status, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the patients are seen in our clinics with, with decreasing uh, visit frequency as, as they continue to recover. Um, the recovery time varies quite a bit. We, we, it clearly depends on how sick the patient is pre-transplant. We tell the patients that a recovery period to full function of three to six months is fairly typical. Sometimes it's a, a lot shorter than that, but unfortunately in some cases it can be even longer. And it's clearly gonna vary based on the individual patient. Next slide. This is where you can really tell that I'm not a surgeon. Um, whether the person, whether the recipient is going to receive a full graft from a deceased donor or a right lobe from a living donor, their own liver needs to be completely removed. And then the new liver is connected and the number of connections is actually fairly small. There's an inflowing vein called the portal vein that we have to connect. There's an inflowing artery called the hepatic artery, HA, that we have to connect. There's an outflowing vein called the hepatic veins, which are not labeled here, but appear as the blue thing behind the liver on the upper part of the recipient slide. And then of course, there's the bile duct to allow bile to drain from the donor liver, either directly into the patient's intestine through their own duct or indirectly through a branch of the, of their, of the loop intestine that we bring up as well. For those that receive a living donor transplant, they receive approximately 65 to 70% of a full-size liver. Um, and, and that liver will return to almost normal size within eight weeks and is actually normal in size and weight by the, by the 10 to 12 week mark. It's remarkable really how rapidly the liver regenerates both in the recipient and in the donor. The, the, the recipient gives up the gallbladder. Uh, as I always say, no extra charge for that. Uh, the recipient's bile duct may need support with a stent as is mentioned on the right-hand side, that stent is taken out subsequently using an endoscopy machine. Most of our patients, uh, can expect to receive some blood products, but we actually have a fair number of patients who get through their entire liver transplant without receiving any form of transfusion. Uh, the patients typically return to the recovery area and then to the step-down unit or the ICU with drains in place, with tubes in more places than you thought we could ever find places to put tubes in. And those tubes are removed in the subsequent two, three, or four days uh, as the patients recover. Next slide. There are, there's a list of surgical complications that goes on quite a long time. Primary non-function of the graft occurs in less than 1% of cases and that liver needs to be urgently replaced. Blood clotting affecting the artery or the veins occurs in a little bit more than 1%, but serious issues occur in about 1%. Bleeding, of course, is expected after major surgery like this, particularly when our patients come into transplant with impaired blood clotting. A bile leak requiring Management with an endoscopy scope or with surgery or with external drainage can occur in about a fifth of our patients. Another fifth of our patients may experience other ability to tract complications. Acute rejection occurs in about 15 to 20% of our patients. 90% of those cases are managed through simply adjusting the patient's medications. I've been doing this for 27 years and I've been around for 3,800 liver transplants and I can only recall one case where the new liver needed to be replaced urgently because of completely refractory rejection. So I always say we don't fear rejection, we just respect it. 
and we modify the immunosuppressive medications that we use based on that individual patient's uh, uh, potential for rejection. Uh, any other, any operation puts a tremendous amount of stress on the cardiovascular system, on the kidneys, on the brain, on the lungs, and all these other things as well. And not surprising, we see the full gamut of complications in our patients. Although in any individual patient, the risk of complications that might lead to a longer stay in hospital or might put the patient's life at risk is actually still measured in the 10% range. Uh, next slide. Uh, teaching our patients both pre and post transplant about caring for their new or organ is very important to us. The patients have a dedicated teaching session prior to discharge to learn about their medications but most of them are very well informed about these medications beforehand. Regular blood tests, clinic visits, occasional ultrasounds, and even the odd liver biopsy is necessary to both monitor liver function and to assess the graft for signs of problems. Immunosuppressive medications are adjusted very frequently for the first several weeks and several months, and less and less so long-term as the number and doses of those medications is ultimately reduced. Uh, not only do we see this list of comorbidities fairly commonly, but we aggravate many of them with the medications that we use, the, both steroids and, and, and uh, standard anti-rejection drugs such as tacolimus or cyclosporin will raise the blood sugars, increase the risk of cancer. Uh, we see increasing problems with obesity, particularly in our fatty liver population. And we see issues with cardiovascular disease, with renal impairment and with cancers as well. I, I think it's important to remember though for our recipients that beyond the first year, the commonest cause of death in patients who undergo a liver transplant is cardiovascular disease followed by cancer, which is exactly the same as the commonest causes of death in the general population. Or as I like to say to my patients, we'll stop you from dying of your liver disease. You get to suffer from the same things that everybody else does. And hopefully we won't magnify any of those things by too much with the medications that we're forced to use. Next slide. Um, this, this is not generally true in every patient, uh, because we have such a high number of patients who are diabetic, who have uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, regular surveillance for their heart function is sometimes appropriate. Uh, regular ultrasounds are often done. CT scans are done rigorously in patients that are transplanted for cancer. There are a number of patients that are at high risk for upper gastrointestinal malignancies or lower gastrointestinal malignancies and the appropriate endoscopies are organized. And we do encourage our patients to see their primary care providers to have their bones looked at because of the adverse effect on bone densities of liver disease and of some of the medications that we use. We see, we follow approximately 2000 patients in our post-transplant clinics. So many of them that this slide now has to be changed to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. All the clinics run in the morning and only mine ends at two o'clock in the afternoon for some reason. Everybody else seems to be able to finish faster than me. Next slide. Um, all the information about the medications is available online. Um, um, that's one of the advantages of our patients generally having access to this information. And we have dedicated pharmacists that come in particularly handy as we sort out drug-drug interactions. And that's been a particularly valuable resource for us with the new drugs that are used to treat hepatitis C and with the drugs that are now used to treat COVID. Next slide. I can go on like this forever. And, and, and I've been often been accused of doing so. Um, uh, there is nothing more gratifying as a transplant physician to see someone that you've looked after for a year on the waiting list, disappear into the OR, come out with a brand new liver, go home 10 days later, and come and see me in the clinic for years that follow. And just to, just for encouragement purposes, I, I looked this up recently. We have a, we have a patient in our general practice who just celebrated earlier this year, his 40th year of being a liver transplant recipient. And that is absolutely remarkable. I have a patient who celebrated his 91st birthday in, in September and he was transplanted in 1996 and he's still doing well. Um, uh, we have very high numbers of patients now in their seventies and even in their eighties. And sometimes I joke with them and say, you know, the liver is now the best part because it's probably not 80 years old after all, and everything else is. And these patients are enjoying a life expectancy similar or identical to that that they would have enjoyed if they had never had liver disease in the first place. And that of course is our goal. 
And I, I often bring these statistics up in the clinic I run today because patients get pretty discouraged sitting on the waiting list. And then those patients that are transplanted who have complicated early post-transplant courses are often very relieved to hear that not only have we seen this exact set of problems hundreds of times before, but the vast majority of those patients are going to be alive and well one year, five year, 10 years, 20, and even, as I said, 30, 35, and 40 years later. As someone who's been doing this for 30 years, it's been very gratifying for me to see how well these patients have done and for how long. And it's very, very satisfying for me to provide care for people like Sandra. And that's the end of my part. I think I went a bit long. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lilly, for that, uh, that great overview. Um, I will uh, pass it to uh, Sandra now. I'll just give a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Sandra has received a liver transplant in 1997. And after several years of going undiagnosed with a rare liver disease and Crohn's, uh, she required a, a few different uh, surgeries and has dealt with definitely some other conditions along her journey. And she's used her lived experience as a transplant patient and a benefactor of organ donation uh, to continue to advocate uh, for organ and tissue donation and, of course, help others uh, living with diseases uh, required in transplant. Uh, so it was my pleasure to uh, pass the mic or the virtual mic um, over to Sandra uh, to share her story. Thanks, Sam. So it was a pleasure to hear Dr. Lilly speak. Uh, it looks like I was one of his first patients if he's been doing it for 27 years. Our first appointment was in December of 95. So uh, yeah, so you, you gave my input. So um, I can tell my story, but uh, it's gonna take a long time because uh, the one great thing about that is um, it's been uh, 25 years this February. Um, but you can see uh, in the picture there uh, that I have in the top left-hand corner, there's a picture before this that shows that I was more of a heavy set person to begin with, but the girl in the top left-hand corner is who the liver team met when they first saw me. And I had already lost probably about hundred pounds. Um, I was yellow, I was skinny, um, I was so tired, um, but, uh, one of the things I, I, once I did all the things that were there, like do all the tests and get on the program, um, things are a lot different, right? So um, back then, so for example, there wasn't a living donor program back in uh, 1997. It didn't start at Toronto General until 1999. And um, it's interesting to see the long-term survival rate of both. But I also think if we had the data in front of us, we would see that a lot of people are having living donation done as compared to deceased donation. Um, and that's why I'm still, um, I would say advocate, well, I'm an advocate, but I also help raise awareness for organ and tissue donation because we don't have enough donors for all those people on the list. And as Dr. Lilly said, the list here at, at Toronto Hospital is about 250 probably give or take depending on the time. At the time, there was only 80, I believe, that were waiting. So when people ask me, well, how long did you wait? Well, my wait was about eight months, um, which didn't seem like a long time compared to now, but also based on all that other criteria, except for the MELT score, which wasn't uh, put into place when I, when I was transplanted. Um, I don't think I would have seen, um, I got my transplant at the end of February, I don't think I would have seen all of March at all. So I'm obviously grateful to the transplant team. Um, things have changed for sure. Um, the whole trans, like, for, I was just watching last night, the Toronto Foundation, about their new ER. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's so much different than the, the long, dark hallway and uh, they, you, everyone that goes there is now, there's lots of food to choose from. We had a drug seas, the cafeteria, and this little hole in the wall pizza place that you could get something to eat at. Um, and it does make a big difference when you're down there, especially for a lot of people who have to travel into the city um, for their appointments. And uh, the testing does take some time. Uh, I do notice that the clinic times are, are, are different, but 
Um, Dr. Lilly, uh, I appreciate that he he takes he takes the time that is necessary for patients, uh, and I'm sure I I can probably guarantee he's still doing that. Um, you know, it's just, there's always such a rush, and it's so important that you know that we're able to get all of our questions answered and not. Um, the other thing is is that the care team is excellent and. Uh, the most important part of that care team is also yourself. Um, you know, you need to be an active member of that care team as well. And I'll go into some tips afterwards. But what has also changed though is, although I did get a psych evaluation, I did have a social worker, I did have um, a nutritionist that went over the food guide with me, but someone who also was diagnosed with Crohn's at the same time, it was hard. And at the time, there wasn't really much said about the, the physical part. I did have the therapist come, and uh, Denise is probably still there, um, you know, talk, showing me how to breathe and make sure I could walk um, so that I could go home. Um, but one of the things I am working on is part of my work that I'm doing with Canadian Donation Transplant Research Program is where there's research that has been done to show the importance of doing um, exercise pre and post transplant. So, you know, I, I was basically told like, you know, go home and don't get sick. And uh, basically I spent all day on the couch and, you know, and uh, most of the time actually during the day I was sleeping and at nighttime I was up, which does happen. But I guess now there could be, um, you know, even some basic exercises you can do while you're sitting. And this is also something that they're looking at for patients who are on dialysis. Um, you know, because those of us who went down the hospital, we would see the lung program and uh, the program that they were getting, you know, to keep in shape. Um, so yeah, so all those things, although they were offered at the time, I don't think at the time, the timing was always great. Um, but now what we're trying to do um, is put it into the integrated care where everything is taken care of. Um, so yeah, my surgery, I think was pretty close to the record. It was three and a half hours, which surprised my family. And I got out in eight days, but there's no, comp there's no really, um, there's no uh, competition there. It just happens to be my experience. Um, but I've also, for my ostomy that I had ended up getting is 10 years now. Um, I think I was in the hospital for 18 and seven of those were in ICU, which were a nightmare. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know, though, is um, the success that I've had since my transplant. So I've been able to uh, travel all over the world and attend um, one of the things I did post-transplant is I joined the Canadian Transplant Association. I had actually found a uh, brochure in the uh, hospital waiting room. It says, Team Canada wants you. And it was I was reading about Team Canada that was that year of my transplant, 1997, were going to Australia. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I wouldn't mind doing something like that someday. And uh, so I didn't go to Australia because I was only like six months after my transplant. But the following uh, 1999, I did go to my first world transplant games in Budapest, Hungary, which was a lifetime experience since I hadn't been too far. Since then, I've attended all nine Canadian transplant games. I've won lots of medals. I've been able to give them to my doctors, my donor family. Um, and my, my mom and my dad and, and uh, some of other family members. I went to six American transplant games and that was a great experience because um, that the, the American transplant game that's huge, but they also had the first games we were at, my husband and I, there was 1500 donor family members there. And they, as they came into the, um, the sports arena at the wide world of sports, which is part of in Florida, um, there was a 20 minute standing ovation for them. And it was really neat to meet someone like, you know, here's my, uh, my donor and here's my donor's family. I'm the recipient and stuff. That was interesting. Uh, and I've also been to seven world transplant games and I've been able to travel to places like Thailand, Australia, um, 
and uh, there's other places as well, but my last ones were in 2011 in Sweden, where I got to carry the flag for Team Canada, and that's in the bottom. Quickly, my advocate work has been a lot with the CTA. Um, I've been around since the uh, Show Him Gift of Life was the MARE program, Organ Donation Ontario. I can't even think of the amount of presentations and talks and malls and schools and things that, that I've done. Uh, my most uh, interesting one is I ended up doing a health fair at Warkworth Institute, which is a, a jail. And I just shared that with some transplant friends lately and they got a kick out of that. I've done some work with Canadian Blood Services uh, and uh, CDTRP. I'm a patient partner there and uh, I'm really excited about the work I've done. I've been with them for nine years as they celebrate 10 years this year. And I've also got involved with the organ tissue donation collaboration. So you wonder why I do all this. I, I do all this because I want people to benefit like I have. And to, to reduce that list of, you know, seems to be 1,500 Ontarians and over 4,000 Canadians that continue to wait. But as Dr. Lilly said, like, you know, a transplant is definitely not a cure but it's definitely a better quality of life of living with the diseases that cause us to have our liver to fail. Um, and even for, you know, all the other organ transplants. Some of the, I'll be quick one more time thing. The other things I've been able to experience is watch my, uh, my uh, nephew and my two nieces grow up. Uh, two of them have gone on to have kids. So now I have three great nephews and there's nothing more like hearing holding on to a baby when uh, you know it's a, a few generations that you know that you might not have been here um, and I've been on all kinds of trips and I've been able to spend time with family and friends and especially the transplant community they're absolutely amazing I'll pause there and I'll leave my tips for after um, our next speaker speaks about her journey thank you Thank you, Sandra, for that uh, a great talk. And yeah, we'll, we'll take some questions at the end. And we had a, a few kind of general um, questions that we can definitely ask you and, uh, and speak here shortly. Um, speak over next speaker. I will, uh, uh, I gave a brief introduction um, earlier, but I'll introduce her once again. Uh, Sophia Petliar is a uh, pre-lung transplant coordinator at the Edgemere Transplant Center. And she received a liver transplant earlier this year, uh, thanks to her sister, and uh, living donor Maya. So I will uh, pass the uh, the mic to uh, Svia to, to share her story. Thank you, thank you, Nam, and uh, thank you everybody for letting me join. Um, it's the first time that I participated in any kind of uh, this kind of events. Um, yeah, it's been seven months and a bit. I had the transplant back in April. Um, back in April 2022, still the current year. And of course, last thing that I was thinking about joining the UHN team is that I would find myself on the list. And in the retrospect, I'm kind of glad that I didn't accept the liver coordinator position. That would have been totally awkward. Um, I can just echo what um, Sandra said. For now, it's kind of hard for me to agree with the statement that um, liver transplant is more for quality of life because I do feel like I literally got my life back, but it's only six months, I still don't know. That's, it's an amazing experience. Um, I probably haven't realized how unwell I had been prior to the transplant until receiving that. And uh, I do think that I have been very, very lucky. Um, as soon as I got on the list, of course, um, the workup for a living donor started and my sister was the first one who submitted her application. She actually tried to do that. She did it on purpose. Uh, she <laughs> rushed in because she thought that she would be the perfect donor for me. I had three other family members lined up and actually she was right. She was the match and uh, going on the list in December, getting the transplant in April, that's really, really fast. And I do know that if I did not have that, um, with PSC, I probably could have been one of the, the people waiting for months and months and months and sometimes years. Um, so 
I guess first thing that I did after going after coming back home and feeling somewhat better is reaching out to the living donation center and um, saying, "Hey, I'm here, and if there's anything that I can do to tell me if I get if telling my story is going to help promote to living donation, I'm here. I'm here to do that." So. Um, the surgery lasted about 10 hours. Uh, of course, I don't remember, but apparently the first thing that I did after opening my eyes is asking, how's my sister? Where is she and how she's doing? I do not remember that, but oh well. <laughs> um, feeling absolutely amazing day one after surgery. In contrary, <laughs> my sister was wiped out for about a week. But right now she's fully recovered. I'm also fully recovered. I'm back to work as a lung transplant coordinator. Um, all this experience obviously helped me understand my own recipients because this is who I work with. I'm the pre-transplant coordinator to understand and feel them much, much better. Uh, my sister Maya is back to work as well. Um, my, well, right now I'm also thinking about maybe joining the uh, transplant games, never heard of that. Um, but yeah, I'm back to, I can't even say that I'm back to running my seven kilometers because I never did that before. All I could do was five, but now I'm, I'm able to run. And yes, I also do want to echo that, the importance of them. Um, of a physical fitness. I know it's kind of ironic where we do tell our patients, please try and stay and remain strong and keep um, exercising. And it's so hard when you're so sick, but it is super important. And it's probably the best thing that you can do for yourself is remain active. Do not sit around, walk as much as you can, do the breathing exercises and uh, it makes a difference. Mm. I guess this is my story for now. It's only been seven months, so I don't have much to tell. I have been through what Dr. Uh, Lily mentioned, the ups and downs, the adjustment of medications pretty much on a daily basis, uh, acute rejection, which yes, um, we were able to just get to just get, um, get it under control with adjusting the medications again and again and again, and now I'm fine, uh, fairly stable, have transitioned back to my hepatologist. And um, yeah, I guess the fact that I'm back to work and still know what I'm doing, it yeah, speaks for itself. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for that uh, great, great story. It's definitely, again, still a, a new process, I bet. So it's hard to uh, think back of, of sharing a story when it's been so recent. Um, so we'll go into a brief Q&A. We'll have a few minutes here. So um, I'll have Sandra and, and Sophia back on camera as well. And um, maybe we'll just ask a few questions and I can pass it to, to Sandra for maybe a, and, and Sophia as well to maybe provide some final tips or suggestions. Uh, but I suppose one of the main questions that we get from our end at the Liver Foundation um, is to do with the anti-rejection medication um, or the regimen itself. Um, perhaps maybe both of you can just quickly highlight what a day uh, would look like in terms of how many medications uh, you would require to take. And if there are any side effects that you may be aware of that you have or have not experienced and um, how to generally manage or, or cope with that. Um, I guess I'll go with Sandra first and then uh, Tvia can, can perhaps answer as well. Yeah, well, at first, yeah, of course, everything. Um, so first of all, um, I've been on cyclosporin all this time. So as, as I got my transplant, they were just bringing out Prograf or Tacrolimus or whatever is, uh, different names that people are calling that use for it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I started, um, you know, growing hair where I wasn't used to uh, having it, you know, my face, my arms, my bushy eyebrows and stuff, um, a little bit of finger, like, but it's just your body getting used to it. Like I was on a high dose. I think I went from 700 in the hospital down to 400 to 350. And I just got reduced for the first time in a long time. I was always at 100 milligrams twice a day. And um, because it's always a concern of my disease returning, which is the same as uh, to Ziva there. Um, 
of primary sclerosis cholangitis. So now I'm taking 75, which is actually harder because it's six pills a day instead of two. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just say that, you know, it's, it's very important that you adhere to them. I'm not sure what um, the other pills take, take, taste like, but cyclosporin is, is gross. It smells like horse. Um, yeah, it's just it's really gross. But yeah, you take them and, and you need to. And they unfortunately, you know, I, I do have some uh, kidney disease, kidney related problems probably because of the medications, but I was also on prednisone for a long time because of my Crohn's disease. And as Dr. Lowley said, I mean, the transplant team took me off that within one year. So uh, yeah, there's side effects, there's side effects on every medication. Um, and you do have to be cautious because you know you are basically what they're doing is lowering your immune system. So your body doesn't do its natural thing, which is just to reject what it considers foreign. And um, yeah, but adhere to it and uh, your blood work as well. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Tia, anything to add on, on your end with respect to uh, medications uh, post-surgery? Um, of course. Um, part of my teaching that, that I deliver to my patients is there is no such a thing as no rejection. Rejection is expected. This is not our native organ, and we all will get that. But luckily, we have something to do with that. And those are the medications and adherence is, is so important. Having said that, of course, two weeks into, into my discharge, first thing that I did was forgetting to take that. After this, I just set up my alarm. I just set up my alarm that goes off twice a day. As soon as my kids hear the sound, they yell at me, take your pills. And they do take my pills. There has been a lot of adjustment. Um, I'm on my 40 and um, tacrolimus that I do tolerate fairly well, but the prednisone, oh my God. Um, nightmares, um, I don't know, I emailed in the middle of the night to my colleague coordinators with some stupid questions work related. Like nightmares, you can't, I'm saying nightmares, but at the same time you can't sleep, but it's worth it the final result does work it. And yes, the blood work is being monitored very, very closely. And actually the goal of the team, um, which I'm a part of, and now I'm saying as a patient, the patient is always a part of the team. And really the common goal of this team of your coordinator, your doctor, and um, the patient um, themselves, and of course, all these people around, the goal is to ultimately reduce um, the immunosuppression because everybody is very, very mindful of potential side effects. So as soon as it was possible, as soon as the blood work showed some improvement, uh, they would try and um, bring it down. And they, at times they would call me twice a day and change the medication regimen. And um, it's actually very, very appreciated because I do know that there is someone who is watching that as closely as I do. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, uh, Sandra and Steve, for that. Um, we'll just take, uh, I guess, maybe the last few minutes if they both have anything uh, final to add or any kind of tips, suggestions um, as we uh, wrap up the Q&A. So Sandra, I'll let you uh, go first and then- we can Yeah, I, I did write down some tips. Sure. So um, I said before, like, make sure you bring a notepad, take notes, ask questions, uh, bring someone with you, uh, especially for those with liver disease, because you're your um, brain can sometimes not work, but I say that for everyone and for all, all healthcare appointments, bring someone with you. It's a different perspective. If there's a mentor program still available or there's someone you can connect with, you know, the Liver Foundation, there used to be one at UHN, um, but you can find one, have a support team, ask for help. And with the liver, like rest when you're tired, don't worry that you're sleeping during, like I have a friend who has uh, PBC right now, PBS or PBC, there's uh, different names for it now. Um, and she's like, oh, you know, I'm sleeping during the day. And I go, yeah, that's what you, you do. Your body churns, you sleep during the day and you're up all night. Just sleep when you do your can be. Um, be cautious around sick people, even like before transplant, definitely after. And just for those that, um, that have just had their transplant, um, or have been having their transplant for two years. Mental health issues is very common. 70, 80% of transplant recipients 
will have some form of mental health, P PTSD or whatever within two years of having a transplant. It's normal, don't feel guilty, seek the help, it's there. And um, yeah, again, and then just um, follow like the, the physio, the before and the after, the nutrition, exercise, and, and just live your life. Perfect, thanks, Sita. Uh, do you have anything on your end to add as a final uh, tip, suggestions uh, for the audience or perhaps those who are joining either post-transplant uh, or perhaps those who have family members who are post-transplant? Probably because being quite fresh post-surgery, uh, um, I want to talk about pain. Pain control, pain after surgery, super important. Again, this is something that I tell my patients. Uh, please take your pain medication post-surgery because there is still this um, perception in our society that uh, if, it, if it doesn't hurt you, you don't take your pill, please do. The staff, they know what they're doing. And if you prescribe your pain medicine every three hours, please do take them every three hours because this would allow you to move. It would allow you to breathe and expect your lungs. And uh, don't do the thing that I did as a healthcare professional. The exact opposite of what I'm telling all of my patients is trying maybe not to take them because they might get me drowsy. And what if I get addicted? Oh, well, no. It's very, very important. Pain control is super important. This would actually help you recover faster. And I did not get addicted. Perfect. Thank you for that, Sia. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll conclude with that ends, because uh, that is one of the final answers, and we're just about a few minutes over. So I do want to um, thank everyone who's uh, attended today. That Dr. Leslie had to um, depart earlier, but uh, of course, thank Dr. Lily for uh, being the great healthcare provider and, and speaker uh, for the session. Uh, thank you, of course, to our panel speakers, uh, both Svia and, and Sandra, for those wonderful perception about the, uh, the journey, some, of course, the long journey and, and the short term journey. And of course, I want to thank our partners at the uh, UH Merit Transplant Center. Uh, of course, their information is on the screen. And of course, the Center for Living Organ Donation for helping with this uh, great educational webinar series for this year. As mentioned, this webinar will be available on both the CLF and uh, UHN uh, Facebook page, uh, YouTube channels, and um, our pretty much social media channels over the next um, few days. Um, I do want to highlight that uh, we will be having a new um, quarterly series that will be returning in 2023. Um, our first session in the new year will be held in February, and it will be addressing alcohol consumption um, and liver health. It will be also addressing alcohol-related liver conditions or liver diseases, uh, as well as indications for transplant and everything related to transplant uh, with respects to alcohol. Um, so... For sure, if you want to learn more about liver disease or to find out about the Canadian Liver Foundation, please visit our website. That's liver.ca. And please be sure to follow us on our social media channel. Um, of course, our partners at UHN and their um, organization and being able to contact uh, the UHN team um, is extremely valuable for those who want additional information on the pre and post transplant journey. Uh, so, of course, I want to thank everyone for attending our quarterly series uh, in 2022. Those are the four sessions that we hosted. And of course, stay tuned for a full session calendar for next year's series uh, by again, following either the UHN and the CLF on our social media channels. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, until next time and uh, take care.